In this short video, we're going to learn about different ways of describing or classifying linear systems. So first of all, we need to be able to distinguish between linear systems which have at least one solution or no solution. So if there's at least one solution, we call the linear system consistent. On the other hand, if there's no solution, it's called inconsistent. So let's look at some familiar examples from elementary algebra. If we have a system of two equations with two variables, x and y, and if there's exactly one solution, well, it's a consistent system, and there's one solution. Graphically, that means the two lines meet at a single point. If the lines are actually overlapping, then every point on either line is a solution to the system. We still call this a consistent system. It simply has infinitely many solutions. And then finally, if the lines don't meet at any point, then we know that there is no solution and it's an inconsistent system. So if you have a linear system with m equations and n variables, then if we have um, fewer equations than variables, so in other words, if our linear system would fit into a short wide box like that, it would be called underdetermined. And if you have the same number of equations as you have variables, then it's just called square, just like a square matrix. And then the system is overdetermined if you have more equations than variables. So the image that you should have in mind there is a tall, thin system, or a tall, thin, augmented matrix. So again, uh, here, if I have only one equation in R2, so here we are in R2, only one equation, always two variables, right? Only one equation, but two variables. Then I have uh, more variables than equations, so it's underdetermined. But it's consistent in this case because any point on the line would uh, be a solution. Uh, if I have uh, two equations and always two variables, and in this case they meet at a single point, then that is a square system, which is consistent. If they are parallel lines, they don't meet at any point. It's a square system because you have the same number of equations as you do variables, but it's inconsistent. If you have two equations and they are actually the same equation or e different equations for the same line, then it's a square system and it's consistent. And then if you have uh, in this case, I have three lines. That means I have three equations, only two variables. It's overdetermined. The lines don't meet in any single point, so it's inconsistent. And here I have three lines, so three equations, two variables. It's overdetermined. And they all meet at one point, so that is consistent. So we have inconsistent versus consistent. We have underdetermined, square, and overdetermined. And our next classification is homogeneous. A homogeneous system has a right-hand side of all zeros. So 
in the augmented matrix then, your right hand side portion would just be a zero vector. So here we have your coefficient matrix. Again, M is the number of equations, which means the number of rows. N is the number of variables, which is the number of columns in the coefficient matrix. And then the right-hand side in a homogeneous system will have all zeros. So what can we say about homogeneous systems? Well, the zero vector is always a solution. So what do I mean by having a vector as a solution? Well, suppose that I have x plus y equals 0, 2x minus y equals 0. Then certainly a solution to this system of equations is x would be x comma y would be the vector where x equals 0 and y equals 0. So we can always have all of the variables set equal to 0. That will ensure that the right-hand side is 0. So a homogeneous solution always has a solution where all of the variables are set equal to 0. We call that the trivial solution because it's always there. No work is needed to find it. It's always there. Now there could be a non-zero solution. There could be infinitely many non-zero solutions. Any of those would be called a non-trivial solution. And again, a non-zero solution means at least one of the variables does not equal zero. And so we can say that a homogeneous system is always consistent. It always has a trivial solution. It might have non-trivial solutions, but it always has a solution, so it's consistent. What about systems with infinitely many solutions? So in R2, that's where the uh, lines overlap. In R3, you could have overlapping planes, but you could also have planes that just intersect in a line, two planes intersecting in a line, or three planes intersecting in three lines, and <coughs> those would have infinitely many solutions. So in terms of our reduced row echelon form, if we look at the augmented matrix, if we have at least one free variable, then you're going to have infinitely many solutions. And that makes sense, because remember, in our solution, the free variable is called free because it can take on any real number as its value and provide a solution to the system. Of course, you have to set the other variables correctly, but the free variables, we replace them with a parameter, and the parameter could be any real number. So now let's think about that for a minute. If you have an augmented matrix, the number of rows is the same as the number of equations. And that you can have at most one leading one in each row. That's just by definition, right? The leading one is going to be the first non-zero entry in each row. So it, once you get to the reduced row echelon form, you can have at least one, I mean at most, one leading one in each row. So if you have more variables than equations, so remember more variables than equation means underdetermined. more variables than equations, then it must have more variables than rows in the augmented matrix. And it must have then more variables than the leading ones, or it must have more variables than the leading variables. And so it has to have at least one free variable. So an underdetermined system must have at least one free variable because there are more variables than rows. And since it has at least one free variable, it must have 
infinitely many solutions. It has an infinite number of solutions. That's an underdetermined homogeneous system. So we're looking at both of those things, an underdetermined and homogeneous system of equations. All right, so uh, we're going to look at another way of uh, viewing systems of equations in terms of matrix vector products. And uh, this is going to be very useful throughout the rest of the course. So the first thing we're going to note is that we can say that vectors are algebraically equivalent to column matrices, or we could just call this a <coughs> column vector. So these are two different ways of writing the components. We've been using the angle brackets, separating the components by commas, but we could have written them as a single column, like a column matrix, with each entry then, or each component, being its own row. So the vector with components 1, 2, 2, 0 could be written with the angle brackets and then the columns separating it, or we could write it in this vertical format. So let's look at uh, how to multiply a matrix times a vector. And the, we're going to start with just a single row, a matrix with a single row. We're going to multiply it times this vector, which we've written as a column vector here. When I form the product, there's a two-step process here. What I'm going to do, let me go back, is first multiply each component here. So I'm going to take each row entry, multiply it times the corresponding component. So I multiply negative 1 times 10, then I'll do 2 times 20, and then finally I'll do 8 times 30. And after I form those products, I'm just going to go ahead and add them together to get my final result. So again, it's a two-step process. First thing we're going to do is multiply each entry by the corresponding vector component and then sum up the products. Well, what if I have m more rows? Like here I have four rows. Multiply it times the same vector. Well, I just look at each row individually. I'm going to perform the same process of multiplying the corresponding entries and then adding them together. But each time I do that, I'll get a new row, or you could think of it as a new component in the result. So if I take the first row, and then multiply it times that vector using my two-step process. Then I'll move on and I'll do the second row times that vector. That'll give me my second component, or you can think of it as the second row in the answer. And then I'll do the same thing with the third row and whatever other rows remain. So then I'll get an answer with four rows, or if you, if you think of the answer as a vector, it'd be four components. Now that's kind of our standard way, uh, uh, grade school way, of learning how to perform matrix vector multiplication. And if that's all you're interested in doing is knowing the product, then th that's a fine way of doing it. Uh, but there is a more a uh, sophisticated way of viewing matrix vector multiplication, which will be much more useful in this course. And it starts with this idea of partitioning the matrix column-wise. So you think of uh, your matrix, uh, which has, uh, in this case, I should have said n columns, but uh, let me go ahead and make that update. Really, I, I shouldn't say assume that it's a square matrix. So really, instead of saying a sub n, I should say a sub n. 
n columns, and each column has m entries. So let's look at an example to see what I mean. Here's a, we could think of this as being the matrix A. It has three columns. Consider each column as its own column vector. And so the first column is what I would call A sub 1, the vector A sub 1, vector A sub 2, vector A sub 3. Because then when I look at it that way, if I take a matrix with these columns and I uh, multiply it here times a vector, then I can do the same two-step process that I did with a row matrix times a vector, which was to first multiply each vector times its corresponding component, and then sum them up. So again, we have the same two-step process. We're going to multiply each column, or column vector, by the corresponding vector component, and then sum up the resulting products. So what you get then is a new vector, and it can be viewed as a linear combination of the columns of A. This is a really very useful way of viewing the matrix vector product, that we're really taking a linear combination of the columns of the matrix, and the coefficients are the components of the vector. Let's look at an example. So this is the example that we used to calculate before using the standard process. But now, let's look at this as column vector negative 1, 1, 0, 9, the first column multiplied by 10. 10 is the first component, second column multiplied by the second component, and third column multiplied by the third component. And so we can go ahead and multiply in those uh, coefficients now, and then add up those three vectors, and of course we get the same product that we saw before. So a couple of properties of matrix mul mul vector multiplication and a couple of new vocabulary words that we will use throughout the course. One is this additivity property. It just simply it is what it looks like. It looks like a distributive property. You can distribute the matrix. If you have a sum of vectors, you can distribute the matrix multiplication across each of the vector and then sum up the matrix vector products. And then this one has a new word for you, I'm sure, homogeneity. And homogeneity is a big word, but it has a simple idea. It just says that you can factor a scalar out of the multiplication. In other words, if you take a vector, multiply it by a scalar, then multiply it by a matrix, you'll get the same answer if you first perform the matrix vector multiplication and then multiply that times the scalar. All right, so we had a previous example where we were trying to determine if a vector b was a, it belonged to the span of these three vectors, v1, v2, and v3. We answer this problem by using a, a system of equations and we could write that as a matrix vector equation. So you would have the coefficient matrix A times the vector of unknowns, is our vector X, equals the right-hand side B. So again, that's our coefficient matrix. And the result that we can say now, using our new, our new vocabulary, is that if you're given a set of vectors, and you can put those vectors as the columns of a matrix, and then to determine if a, another vector belongs to the span of that set of vectors, you look at the corresponding linear system. If it's consistent, then the answer is yes, it belongs to the span. It can be expressed as a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3. 
On the other hand, if there is no solution, if the uh, system is inconsistent, then we know that the vector b would not belong to the span. So I hope you found this video useful, and we'll be using these concepts throughout the course.